All right, so in this podcast, we're going to look at some of the models of the atom and how they have progressed over time. So before we start that, let's define what a model is. So basically, a model is a representation of an idea, um, basically to explain how something is occurring that we can't directly see. So basically, it is um, developed by experimental evidence, and we make a... a um, illustration or representation of what's going on and then as we get new evidence we modify our model to um, meet that new evidence. So scientific models um, they they evolve over time um, when new information becomes available or new materials become available or new technology becomes available we go back and we look at our old models and see does this new information does it fit the old model if it doesn't then we modify that older model to fit our new data so studying um, the structure of atoms is very difficult it's like studying wind you can't see it um, you can definitely feel it um, feel its uh, repercussions, but you can't actually see them. So because they're extremely, extremely small, and even with microscopes, we can't see the structure of the atom with uh, visible light. We can only see the paths it leaves behind. So this makes it very difficult to, um, to have models of the atom. So the first model was Dalton's model. Um, Dalton had five postulates. Basically, he says um, all matter is composed of extremely small particles called atoms. Um, all atoms of a given element are identical. Atoms cannot be created. Um, they can be divided into. Uh, they cannot be created, divided into smaller particles, or destroyed. That part in red was eventually proven wrong. Um, and they they combine in simple whole number ratios to form compounds. And in a chemical reaction, they are separated, combined, or rearranged. So essentially, Dalton thought of the atom as just like a circle, a billiard ball. Next comes Thompson um, and his model of the atom. So he revises Dalton's model because he figures out that overall the atom is neutral, but that there is um, there are negative and positive parts within. So he knows that the positive part is is a is a big bulk of the atom, and then you know the negatives can be um, removed and traded out, so he thinks of them as just scattered out. So basically, we historically call um, Thomson's model the plum pudding model. However, today it might be easier to call it the chocolate chip ice cream model. So in this representation, the ice cream would be just a big positive blob, and then you'd have little negatively charged chips dispersed throughout. So here is um, a way to look at it. So the positive part is the big bulk, and then there's these little negative things kind of interspersed throughout. Thompson's model, though, got um, refuted and, and didn't explain all the evidence that Rutherford uh, came up with. So Rutherford figured out that the positive charge of the atom is not evenly spread throughout, that it's actually concentrated in a very, very small central part of the atom, which we have determined is called the nucleus. So the nucleus is positively charged, it's in the middle, it's very dense. So we had to modify our model of the atom to what uh, Rutherford referred to as the nuclear atom. So in the nuclear atom, we have the nucleus, which is positively charged in the middle, and then we have these little negative parts, the electrons rotating on the outside. Now along comes Bohr. Bohr looked at um, electron emission spectra, so he looked basically at colors of light that were emitted um, from hydrogen when hydrogen was exposed to different quanta of energy. And what he found was that every time hydrogen gave off specific uh, colors, specific wavelengths of light, which led him to believe that electrons are in fixed positions or orbits around the nucleus. We call this the planetary model. So we kind of start to think of electrons as rotating around the nucleus um, at a specific distance from the nucleus in a specific orbit, kind of like um, the planets revolve around the sun. So here's another depiction of it. But again, same thing, electrons moving in orbits at a specific distance from the nucleus, just like our planet uh, revolves around the sun in our solar system. 
Now, Bohr's model, while it was great, it didn't work for anything but hydrogen. Beyond hydrogen, it did not work. Um, some people started doing this stuff called PES, uh, photoelectron spectroscopy, and this data indicated that there were further little smaller leaps within each orbit or ring. So they figured out these were called orbitals. So this is where we get um, what we'll learn later about as called the S, P, D, and F orbitals. So they're further arranged within the rings. And that brings us to what we term now the quantum mechanical model. So the quantum mechanical model says electrons are in these orbitals that are ro uh, rotating around the nucleus. It's not a circular path like we thought with Bohr. Um, and it's, it's very complex and difficult to understand and, and to have a picture of. So here is a nice little um, kind of summary. Uh, there are a couple scientists on here that we didn't talk about. Like, for example, uh, Schrodinger. He was um, one of the ones responsible for figuring out about the orbitals. And then Chadwick. Chadwick figured out there were neutrons through looking at mass spectroscopy.